Thank you, Amber. For those of you who are at the first session, what an amazing job Esteban and Elle did. Just so amazing for seventh graders, 12 year olds, just amazing. Well, our panel is a little bit older than 12. In fact, my oldest granddaughter is 12. So welcome to the Antibias Symposium to the, ground, the Grandparents Round Table. To our next slide. So I'm going to go ahead and start by introducing myself. My name is Judy Crowd. And I'm going to be the moderator for and as director of academics at Pacific Oaks Children's School. So I'm here at the Children's School supporting all of our teachers during this. Um, very trying time that we're going through right now. Um, I am a grandma. Oh, I'm a mom, first of all. I have four children, three grown children, and um, three, four grown children, three daughters, one son. And I'm a grandma of four. I have three granddaughters and one grandson. And my children are Mexican American from the Hopi tribe, and then also German American on my side. Now, my three granddaughters are my daughter's children. So from her side, they have you know, the, the heritage of Mexican American, Hopi, and German American. And my son-in-law is European American. So my three granddaughters are blonde hair, blue eyes. Now my grandson is my son's and my daughter-in-law's son. My son, same heritage obviously as my daughter, and my daughter-in-law is from Ethiopia. So my grandson is growing up as a black boy here in California during all of this turmoil that we're going through. So I have very different experiences with my grandchildren. My granddaughters live in Vancouver, Washington. So I'm a far away grandma with them. I have been since they were born. Skype and then now Zoom. Um, we use a lot of Ring, the doorbell camera, where they'll go outside and talk to me through the doorbell. But the baby who's 19 months old is close. He's right here. So our relationship is a little bit different than it was with my granddaughters when they were his age. So we're growing up a little bit differently and especially during this time of COVID. So even though he's less than a mile away, I am that Zoom grandma, that FaceTime grandma. When I see him, I'm in my car with the window down in the driveway when my son and my daughter-in-law are holding the baby and we're more than six feet apart with masks on. So it's a little bit different for me during this time. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about who I am, and then the rest of our panel is going to introduce themselves as well. So the next on our list, I just went alphabetically, is Professor Yolando Carlos. Professor Carlos, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Judy. So I'd like to take time to thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. And thank you for your part in developing our nation's greatest heritage and future. That would be our children and grandchildren. And thank you for shepherding them and shaping their development and their cultural identities. Because the children, they are the, our future. They, are the, they help, will shape the future of our society and our nation. A little bit about myself. I have two grown children. I have four grandchildren and one great grandchild. I help parent one of my grandchildren so uh, my son, I have a daughter who has one daughter who is of, um, she's European. Uh, my, my daughter married uh, European. Um, so my granddaughter also is kind of like what Judy said. She had her DNA done and she has very little Latina in her and we laugh about it. She is uh, blonde, uh, not pardon me. She's, she's like a, a um, a medium blonde, but she has blue eyes. Uh, she does not look Latina at all. Um, so my daughter had one daughter. My son um, had full custody of his son before my grandson was two, and I helped parent him. He is now uh, 20, 
and he lives with me um, off and on. He's gone to college. Uh, we've, we've gone through the whole gamut of everything. My son remarried when he was uh, 11, and he now has two siblings. Uh, he has a, a six-year-old brother and a four-year-old sister. And my granddaughter, by my daughter, has a little boy. That's my great-grandson. So my daughter and my granddaughter and her family live in Nevada. My daughter lives in Reno, Nevada, and my granddaughter and her family live in Fallon, Nevada. My son and his family live in the same city as I do. So I've been very um, active with all of my grandchildren. And now I'm like Judy, um, the Zoom great grandma to um, my one-year-old great grandson. And now I'll pass it over to Aaron. Okay, thanks, Yolanda. Um, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, I come to the, uh, the panel here from Pacific Oaks as being uh, Dr. Gabriel Young's dad. Um, Gabriel uh, adopted him, um, actually legally didn't adopt him until he was uh, in his early 30s, but I got to know him as a middle schooler. So uh, he's, a, he's my first wife's son. And so we do have the racial difference, but uh, not only is my experience and he's the only kid, kid I have, but I also get a lot of my parenting skills. Uh, see my two of my siblings are on, they each have kids. And so I've always been an uncle that's kind of helped out. Uh, I have nieces and nephews who are African-American and I have some who are biracial, who are European-American as well as African-American uh, and also and it's spreading even more. I have a great nephew who's uh, part, part Latinx. Um, so it just seems very natural for me uh, to have a granddaughter, Gabe's daughter that is, who even though she's all European virtually, that uh, I'm her grandfather from day one. And so with that, I guess I will Hand the mic over to uh, Miguel. And you need to unmute, I believe. Hi, Miguel, we're still having- How's this? There was a hidden button on my- <laughs> Headphones. There you Sorry go. about I'm that. We can hear you. <laughs> okay, great. Well, I was lucky enough to have been born in San Francisco, raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, and luckily enough to have bought a house six blocks away from where I grew up. Uh, I have three children, uh, Sandwich Deal, the boys in the middle, and my oldest daughter has uh, two children. She lives uh, in the Salinas area with her husband. And my uh, son isn't married, doesn't have any children yet. Uh, my youngest daughter has uh, my oldest grandchild. And lucky for me, my daughter and granddaughter are living at my home. So I get to see them often, which is great. Uh, with that, I'll hand it off to Dr. Terry Webster. Thank you, Miguel. Um, I'm Dr. Terry Webster professionally. I'm the Dean uh, of the School of Human Development at Pacific Oaks College. And a little bit about my story is that growing up, my ideas and beliefs regarding kindness and fairness and acceptance and inclusion were largely shaped by my maternal grandparents. They were honest, non-judgmental, modeled behaviors very much associated today with anti-bias and would not tolerate uh, meanness or prejudice or discrimination. So it's my hope that I will influence my grandchildren in similar ways. Uh, I have three adult children, all of whom are married. I have three grandchildren, three-year-old Frida and her one-year-old brother Ludo live in France with my daughter and my son-in-law who is French. Three-year-old Ada lives in the Bay Area with my son and my daughter-in-law. They are growing up in vastly different cultural environments and grandparenting is a challenge due to time zones and distance, especially right now. 
my grandparents lived around the corner from our house. So they were in very close proximity. Uh, very, I had daily conversations with my grandmother. So there was a lot, there was frequent contact. And so my pri primary objective is to create familial proximity and closeness across the miles. And right now we're doing that through storytelling, certainly technology, visits when visits will be possible again and to support my children's parenting goals and values, which thankfully mirror my own. I also want my grandchildren to know as they grow that I am an advocate for them, just as my grandparents were advocates for me. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Thank you for everyone for your introductions. We are so fortunate to have such a great panel on board with us today. What we're going to do next is just talk a little bit about the anti-bias goals. So we'll have a framework for our discussion. So Dr. Webster is going to start by talking about goal one and two, followed by Professor Carlos, who will talk about goal three and four. Dr. Webster, I'll go ahead and give the mic back to you. Thank you. So the four core goals of anti-bias education um, are the result of the groundbreaking work of Louise German Sparks and Julie Olson Edwards. And so I am going to be defining the goals based on their writings and their work was developed with educators in mind. But as we witnessed during the, some, the kidposium, uh, these ideas can and should be introduced at home um, and, and intergenerationally. So goal one identity is where anti-bias education begins. And as stated, teachers will nurture each child's construction of knowledgeable, confident, individual, personal, and social identities. Children will demonstrate self-awareness, confidence, family pride, and positive social identities. When this goal is achieved, children feel strong and proud of who they are without needing to feel superior to anybody else. Social identities include gender, race, ethnic, cultural, religious, and economic class, and so children need to develop both individual and group identities. The second goal is diversity. Teachers will promote each child's comfortable, empathetic interaction with people from diverse backgrounds. Children will express joy with human diversity, use accurate language for human differences, and form deep, caring connections across all dimensions of human diversity. This involves guiding children to think about and have words for how people are the same and also how they are different. And oftentimes teachers, parents, and grandparents may be hesitant to teach children to notice differences. But understanding how people are both the same and different provides children the opportunity to celebrate human diversity. Thank you, Dr. Webster. Professor Carlos, would you like to tell us about goal three and four? Yes, I will. Thank you so much, Judy. So goal number three is children will be able to recognize unfairness, have language to describe unfairness, and to understand that unfairness hurts. And um, how we can do this is through the formation of self-concept. And we have to understand that self-concept begins in early childhood through the formation of their abilities whether they feel that they're capable or not, through their attitudes and their ability to manage their emotions and to problem solve, through the values of self-evaluation, being able to focus on their strengths, their self-respect. What is fair for them is fair for all. And then goal number four, each child will demonstrate empowerment and the skills to act with others or alone against prejudice and or discriminatory acts. As a parent or grandparent, we can help children develop family pride, develop deep caring human connections and the ability to self-reflect and learn how to stand up for themselves and for, through others and others by telling our family stories and also by recounting a story about us when we were a child, when we stood up, when someone stood up for us or did not stand up for us. And then again, we can retell another story of something that happened to us when, that was unfair or unjust as adults so that they can learn through uh, our storytelling. And um, I'll go into these uh, a little bit further as we go on how I've used these with my grandchildren. Thank you, Professor Carlos. Thank you, Dr. Webster. 
I want to talk a little bit about what the flow of this roundtable is going to look like. So if you were in the first presentation, you heard Dr. Fider talk about the history of Pacific Oaks. Pacific Oaks is unique in that our children's school came first. In 1945, a group of Quaker families wanted to have a place for their children right after the war where the children could experience social justice, inclusion, diversity, respect. So that's how the children's school opened with those core values that we still adhere to 75 years later today. About 10 years after the children's school opened, the college, Pacific Oaks College, came from the children's school as a place to train teachers to work in the children's school and progressive education schools similar to ours. So the flow of this round table is going to take on those core values that we have here at PO, building this sense of communi community, building connections, sharing. So rather than us standing up here and just giving you all of the information, it's gonna be a time where we're going to share information together. At PO, that's how we teach our classes. It's a, a learning community where we learn from each other. And so we envision this round table working the same way. So we're gonna start by opening up the floor to questions. And Amber, since you have access to the chat box, can you read any questions that are coming through from any of our grandparents that are participating? It would be my pleasure. Thank you. So at this time, if there are any questions to any of our beloved grandparents, you may enter them in the chat box or Q&A section now. Well, you know what? I actually have a question. So what have been some of the biggest traditions that you've passed on to your children and um, their children around anti-bias education or specifically accepting others? Is there anyone who would like to start with that question? And maybe we can all answer it. Professor Carlos? Sure, I'd like to, um, I, I passed on something that I learned from my grandmother. So it's um, how she passed on culture and tradition. And um, it, how I chose to do it was in my home, I've always loved Diego Rivera artwork. And my home has various artwork pieces of Diego Rivera. This artwork naturally opens opened up conversations and questions by my grandchildren throughout the years. And I use that as an opportunity to tell stories, to understand unfairness. And then not only that, but identity as a member of a targeted group, because Diego Rivera's artwork really focused on that. For example, I have in my living room, um, the one where uh, it's the, the woman that's holding the beautiful calla lilies. And he, my grandson noticed early on that the little boy was helping load things. And he said, what's that little boy doing? Interestingly enough, I had not noticed the child as much as I had noticed the adults in, in the artwork that was hanging in my own um, home. And so then I began to discuss how children in other countries have to work to help the family out. And that they, they were poor people, so they this is how they earned their living. And then he began to ask questions of where did they live? Aren't they like me? And this opened up to further questions and storytelling, storytelling about our family. So uh, for with that being said, then with that, I would take my grandchildren as they were growing up to um, visit art museums and other places so that I could introduce them to our culture, our story, through art, through um, 
music and through um, just different uh, experiences. And I don't want to take up all the time, so I'll open it. I'll leave it for others to speak as well. Thank you, Professor Carlos. Is there anyone else who would like on the panel who would like to answer that question? Yeah, I'll go next. Thanks, Miguel. Um, so I'm a firm believer in early childhood learning uh, through play and experience. And one of the great things that I was able to do was to take my children to various places in San Francisco. So Professor Carlos is uh, uh, revealing that she's got Diego Rivera paintings, reminding me that there are a number of Diego Rivera paintings in San Francisco. So we would go to Coit Tower, we'd go to uh, the Embarcadero Post Office where there's another Diego Rivera painting there. There's a whole street in San Francisco, it's, it's really an alley, uh, but it's covered with murals and each one of those murals has a political bent to it. So those were important things to expose my children to. And one of the things that uh, I let them know is that we are all different, we all look different, but there's one thing that we all have in common and that's something that gets more beautiful when it wrinkles and is always gray and that's your brain. So that's the thing that you need to appreciate about everybody because everybody has a different set of experiences, different talents, different knowledge. And if you listen to them, then you will get the best answers you've ever heard. That is such a wonderful way to connect accepting others and culture and diversity into the rich heritage of your family. So thank you both so much for sharing. Two other additional questions we have, I'll begin with one of them is, have any of you noticed that teachers have different expectations for your grandchildren of color versus grandchildren, your grandchildren who may be white? I'll go ahead and, and take that question. Um, my grandson is not yet in school, but I can tell you that my granddaughters who have blonde hair and blue eyes have this, this privilege that just comes to them that my own children who are brown did not have. So seeing that is like, whoa, because I wasn't expecting it to be different. And I didn't even realize the way the difference in the way that my own children were treated until I saw how my granddaughters were treated. And so when I think about my grandson, he's just about to be 20 months old. And I think about what's going to happen to him as a black boy, um, just as a child, as a person of color. I remember the day he was born, he was born in a birthing center. So we brought him home from the hospital four hours after he was born. As soon as my daughter-in-law had a bowel movement, he went home. And I was sitting with my son in the front room and the baby was um, with my daughter-in-law in the bedroom nursing. And my son looked at me and he said, you know, mom, it wasn't until I held the baby and looked in his face that I realized I going to have that conversation with him. And I said, what conversation? And he goes, Remember that conversation you had with me when I was 10 years old? And I said, I don't remember. And he said, when he was 10 years old, I remember after he told me, he said he was riding his bike. He was supposed to have his helmet on, but instead it was hanging on his handlebars and he got pulled over by the police. They put him on the, um, the curb. He was 10 years old. They put him in handcuffs and they questioned him for not having his helmet on when he was 10 years old. So when he came home and he told me about the experience, I told him, I said, you know, Christopher, whenever a police officer pulls you over or stops you or you know, anything, make sure they can see your hands. Don't put your hands in your pocket. Don't reach for anything. And so I had not remembered having the talk with him, but he remembered that and looking at this baby and knowing that he was going to be raising this black boy in this society, he all of that came to him at one time. So I anticipate that when Savion goes to school, that this is going to happen, that he's going to be treated differently and maybe even in a different way that my brown children were treated that at the time I didn't even realize because I've been in education 
since I was 17 years old. And I've always been very active in my children's education and in their classrooms. And I've always been very present. So I didn't really notice it until the girls were born. So it, it's, we're in a different society. And I'm hoping that I will be able to, and my daughter-in-law especially, will be able to empower my grandson the way for those of you who were in the first session, the way that those parents empowered Esteban, excuse me, and Elle. And she's very purposeful in everything that she's been doing since day one. And she's very interested. She's a special education teacher and she's very interested in writing curriculum on um, African-American history. So I'm hoping that he will grow up to be as strong as the children that were in the session before us. I know that um, Professor Carlos, that um, your grandchildren, while they're not black, they are of color and you have the one that looks light. Do you see a difference in their way they're treated at school? I, I have uh, one that, so my grandson that I helped raise has a brother that's biracial. He's half African-American. And um, he became very sensitive at a young age, understanding that um, he loved him very much, but understanding that he was already noticing as a, at a young age that there um, in the area where we live, there are incidences that happen and it's very um, overt. It's not, um, it's not hidden. And so, what I did with my grandson, how I helped him is through books, through books and through helping him with um, understanding not just compassion, but then also that activism piece. So one of the books that I used with him was Rosa. So it's the book illustrating the courageous act that Rosa took and the events that followed. And through that, we discussed how we could stick up for people. Um, how his brother might experience different things because he lived in a different area of our city of where he was growing up in our town. So he lived in an area where um, it, it was um, the, the housing for um, people on, on welfare. And um, uh, my grandson, uh, when um, it was time for him to see his mother, I would, uh, I was designated by the court to um, meet her at like a McDonald's and then they would play together. But using books and helping my grandson understand unfairness and not just unfairness, but then how, um, how to stick up for others. I worked with him very carefully and throughout all his life, now his, um, brother is in high school, he's a sophomore, and they're still very close. But throughout it all, I believe it's, it's modeling fairness in our everyday actions, and then living it out in our family values. Because we can say things, we can show them things, we can read books, but if we don't live it out, they're not going to catch it, if you will. So I am proud to say to this day, um, my grandson has been a social activist. Maybe he doesn't have the correct activism words, but he understands what's fair and what's not fair, and he'll say something. And he's uh, grown up to be a very, very compassionate young man, very concerned about fairness, and even wanting during Thanksgiving to go work um, with the homeless and helping them feed them for Thanksgiving. Um, so to me, that makes me proud to know that through books, I was able to help give him those skills. And I think Professor Carlos, that a lot of that is a testament to you because you raised him and you have such a strong commitment to antibias education that throughout his life, he was able to get that from you. So when you see him now as a young man at 20 years old, you know, with such compassion and such, you know, activism for what's right, standing for what's right, 
a lot of that comes from you. And as a grandparent, we want to have that same, you know, sense of accomplishment with our grandchildren, because now that our children are grown, you know, other people are raising them. And I think I was a little more concerned about even before I knew who my son was going to marry, I have three daughters. So when I have granddaughters through them, it's a little bit different dynamic when it's your daughter's children than it is when it's your son's children because it's your daughter-in-law. And I didn't know before he married my daughter-in-law who my daughter-in-law was going to be. But I'm very, very fortunate that I'm just as involved, if not more so, with my grandson, my daughter-in-law, and my son's child than I am that you know that I am with my other children. Dr. Webster, I know that you have grandchildren going to school here in America and also grandchildren going to school in another country. And I'm wondering if you have anything to share about what the school experience is like in those two different um, cultures. Well, it's uh, thank you. It's interesting because I was making some notes about that. Um, Ada uh, up north, uh, she's you know blonde haired blue eyed uh she began uh her preschool experience when she was just two and there was a classmate who had some had some developmental challenges and my daughter-in-law was worried about the impact that that might have on ada's learning because this was ada's first schooling uh, opportunity and I talked to her about it and uh, because it really wasn't going to be appropriate for her to move forward. She was far too young to go into the next room. And I, I told my daughter-in-law, give us some time and let's see what happens. And not only did Ada begin to thrive, she began to develop empathy and saw that this other child was being treated differently by other children. And Ada gravitated toward that child. And so I think from a very early age, helping Ada understand that all abilities should be celebrated and all children, including her, should be celebrated. And so that was a very early learning experience that opened up a lot of dialogue between my daughter-in-law and, um, and myself around Ada's um, education. On the other hand, Frida uh, is, you know, she is a she. Her family is binational, bilingual, and uh, when my daughter took Frida to her local national preschool, education in France is is nationalized. Um, she mentioned this to the uh, to the preschool director, who said, "Well, it's all fine and well that your family may be binational and bilingual, but in this school, we're French and we speak French." So my daughter is was very aware about um not wanting her daughter to be marginalized in some way in in the country that she's chosen to be their home so she actually sought out a more child-centered progressive curriculum which took them to a different region they moved uh and frida has just begun that program and is learning about this is this is her very first um, opportunity to be with other children. Um, she was in a very small daycare setting, really only with her brother. Uh, so she's really learning about identity and what it means to be Frida and what it means to be um, new because the children had already started school and she came in about midway. Uh, I will say that one excellent example for for her was that they have all the children in this particular region have chickens they're, they're it's a it's an it's an agricultural region so everybody's got chickens and chicken coops but frida is the only girl who has a chicken that lays blue eggs so uh the other day uh they harvested the blue egg from the um from the from that chicken and she took it to school and was able to be very proud about the fact that she is different. Her family has a chicken that lays blue eggs. It was quite well received by the uh, by the by the children in the school. Miguel or Aaron, do you have anything to add to the question that's on the floor? No. I'm good. <laughs> Go yeah, I think I think so too at this point. Sure, I can. We have another question that just came in. And so one of them is, what are your suggestions for instilling 
the family traditions and stories when we cannot hold our grandchildren on our laps or bring them into our kitchens due to COVID or living far away. I can, I can end, I can speak to this because I am building this grandparenting plane as we are flying it across the planet. Um, so for this year, norm, normally my son and his family would have come down, um, but, but it's, it, it's, it's not wise. So uh, they're, they're staying up north and we've been managing the, uh, the, the across the world uh, Thanksgivings for a couple of years. And so one thing that I've done is I have sent art supplies, which are in limited uh, availability in France. It's nearly impossible to get construction paper or paint or anything for, for young children. So I, I sent over some construction paper, and some other supplies, and uh, likewise up north, and I'm going to be making paper chains with the girls. I think developmentally, that's a that's a, an art project that with their parents' help, we, we can manage. And so we will all have uh, paper chains in our house for the holidays. And I've also, um, and, and this was not something I actually suggested, but my adult children are going to be preparing as part of their Thanksgiving celebrations, one dish that was their favorite from our, Thanksgiving traditions from my grandmother and then to and to me. And there will be stories around the preparation um, of that dish, why it's their favorite, so the children can start to identify what their favorite dishes are going to be. But uh, distance and COVID have really called upon a tremendous amount of creativity. And young children, as much as we think about how much they love screens, when it comes to talking to grandma, it's like grandma in a box and they don't love screens when it comes to talking to, 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 to us over the over the technology. But we're finding different ways, different times of day, being more attuned to when the children are attentive. And so we're hoping to carry on traditions, even though we can't be in person, um, at least not this year. Thank you, Dr. Webster. Now, pre-COVID, I have been, you know, a long distance grandma. I've, I've been a long distance grandma for 12 years. And so one of the things that I started 12 years ago when Emery was born is once a month, I mail the children, my grandchildren up north, I mail them books. So at the post office, you can get a, a box that's um, one price for no matter how much it weighs. So every month from the day that they were born, I have sent books to them. And then I would read the story before it was Skype. Um, now, then I was using GoToMeeting, now I'm using Zoom. And I would take some of those books that I sent them and I would read that story to them. Now I, I record the stories for the baby, I record stories for him. And what I start each um, time with, if we're um, FaceTiming or if we're Skyping or now that we're Zooming, I start it with a song. So I have a special song that I share with each of my grandchildren and there's a special song for each one. And what I'm noticing with the baby that um, he's had before COVID, he had no screen time, zero screen time at all. And um, they were very concerned about how this long distance grandmothering was going to go even though we're only a mile away. And um, they researched and found out that if it's interactive screen time, then that's okay. But if it's passively watching, you know, playing on the computer or, or doing those, you know, video games, that that's not so great for brain development. So I do notice that if he's if he's starting to like wander when I'm talking to him, I'll just start singing his song as I think you're wonderful by Red Grammar. And so I'll just start singing I think you wonderful and all of a sudden he'll smile and he'll look at me. Um, he's just, I mean, he's talking pretty well now, but um, when we first started this Zooming, I, I'd say about October-ish, um, I got on the, the phone and he was like, Obama, Obama, Obama. And my son says, that's who he's talking about. He's been asking for you for two days. So I was Obama Judy for um, a few weeks. I tell my son that's because I debong grandma. But now he, now he can very clearly say Grandma Judy, but having that special something like sending the books, reading the stories, having a special song for them. And then um, with the holidays, carrying down traditions. My husband and I were just talking about that 
this morning. We were talking about Christmas because here in California, um, beginning tonight, a curfew is going to be going into effect. And we're anticipating within the next few weeks that the safer at home orders are probably going to be reinstated. And then we're only going to be able to go out for essential services like the grocery store. Well, in our family, Christmas is a really, really big deal. I usually have about 100 people at my house at Christmas. We move furniture, we have a seven foot live Christmas tree, it's huge. And this morning, my husband said, Christmas tree lots, Judy, are not an essential service. So what is going to be our plan if we can't get a Christmas tree? So we were talking about that because our plan is that we're going to mail just our grandchildren and our children. We're going to do it with just us, mail out the Christmas presents and then via Zoom, open them together at the same time. Singing is very big. Music is very big in our family. So there's songs that we sing at Christmas that we'll sing together. But it may be, we had envisioned us in front of the Christmas tree, fire in the fireplace, singing our songs that we always sing, opening our presents via Zoom. And then this morning we realized, you know what? There might not be a Christmas tree. It might be just us opening the presents. So not only are we reinventing our tradition by doing it distance, now we're reinventing our tradition by may have by maybe having to think differently on what Christmas means to us or looks like. So finding those ways to carry on your traditions with your grandchildren, grandchildren who are far away or during this time of COVID, even if they're close by. Is there anyone else on the panel who would like to share traditions that you're sharing with your grandchildren? Well, I'll say I've got an artificial tree, so. <laughs> I, and, and that might be a choice. My husband yeah. say, Judy, you might have to get an artificial tree. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> I bought mine years ago, so. <laughs> but, but one of the things that I enjoy doing with my children, which is what my parents did with us, is we would go car top camping. And uh, I was pretty lucky that my parents sold me their RV when they bought an RV. So I've taken my children RV camping. And I remember vividly the stories that my children would give me. They would mimic um, these wildlife rangers who were on TV as they went crawling through ice tunnels in Mount Lassen. So, I like telling these embarrassing stories to my grandchildren now. And my children give it a hoot out of it because it's number one, I remember what they did. Number two, what they did was very funny. Number three, my children are getting the idea that, you know what, I wanna do the same thing with my children. And so we are planning having trips once obviously this COVID-19 stuff is all over with, but going on the same routes that my parents took us on to show my grandchildren the same tourist traps that, that we saw when we were children. And I was pretty lucky that um, my older grandchild got to um, come up and visit my parents up in the state of Washington. And they live on a lake uh, and my, my granddaughter, actually caught four trout. And so we remind her of that. So she has that memory and it's connected to my parents. So those are the storytelling I think is, is really good. Uh, storytelling about what's gone on in your family. You know, Miguel, you reminded me of um, what my granddaughter asks me all the time. My, my father was quite the storyteller and he always had such amazing stories to tell and so that was their great grandfather but they grew up with him you know grandpa they didn't make any differentiation and then now since he's passed away they'll come to me and say grandma judy can you tell me grandpa bobby's story about you know the time aunt kathy did this or the time uncle dickie did this and 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 they still love hearing those stories and it's a way to keep my father's memory alive but I'm talking to my grandchildren, telling them stories about people they never met, 
but yet they're feeling close to. So keeping those traditions alive, I think is so important. One time I had a Native American student in one of my classes, and she told me that her tribe has diminished to be so small that there's nobody left in the tribe who speaks the language. And so they're having a historian try to look back and see if they can recapture the language. And so that's one of the things that we need to remember as grandparents is not to let our traditions die with us, to have them carry on with our grandchildren. Yes, Judy, I, I agree with that. Um, I think as grandparents and even as parents, we need to self-reflect on exactly what you were saying. We need to have a sense of self-commitment to a group and not just to a group, but to the concerns and the transmittal of the traditions, the customs, the celebrations, and then to help our children and our grandchildren develop their own cultural identities. But I think first we have to have that deep understanding of our own family stories. And, and that's where we can't let up, like Miguel's passing them on, like you are, like um, Terry, Dr. Webster, and, and, and Gabriel Young's uh, father, uh, Aaron, also. I think it's through those storytelling, like I can remember listening to my grandmother telling me stories. And then my mother, as she came to live with me the last five years of her life and I cared for her, her telling stories. And now my brother and I were talking on the phone the other day and he said, we need to sit down and we need to tell each other these stories. Mm -hmm. And I said, not only do we have to tell each other the stories, we need to begin to write the stories down so that the stories live on. And I believe that as we do this, um, that's how we can strengthen our cultural backgrounds. That's how we build activism in our children but also it helps us to really reflect on any biases that we may have that we don't want to pass on and the value systems that we do want to pass on with our, our children and our grandchildren. So I think it's just mainly being open to that, those storytelling times, maybe making hot chocolate, you know, the Mexican hot chocolate for our family, you know, sitting down with a pan dulce and then sitting down and then um, be able to um, share stories at that point. I think it's that's how we pass down culture. That's how we pass down traditions. But more importantly, that's how we pass down to our children and grandchildren values and how to care for others and what's called care ethics for others so that they go out and make the change in the world that has to happen in today's world. Thank you, Yolanda. To your point about passing on values, how does having seen social uprising in the 60s, 90s, and again today impact each of your perspectives on social justice when speaking to younger generations? So Miguel, maybe we can start with you this time and then pass it over to Aaron. Well, having lived through those times, especially in San Francisco, was was incredible. Um, one of the, I grew up as one of the Kennedy kids, so I was heavily involved in community politics from the time I was 11 years old. Um, back when San Bruno started to become um, something other than a um, literally a dairy cow town, it was um, housing. Uh, for blue collar uh, workers who were at the um, San Francisco Naval um, Naval Yard uh, there at Candlestick Park. Uh, so my dad would carpool with um, a slew of guys to um, Hunter's Point every day. And um, having grown up in our neighborhood, there were plenty of Irish, plenty of Mexicans, plenty of Italians and we would get together. But the other part about it was um, my parents never discouraged. They didn't push me, but they were 
energetic supporters of me being involved in community politics. And um, I, you know, helped a number of people get elected from city council all the way up to, to U.S. Senate and was even lucky enough to spend a whole day with uh, U.S. Senator Alan Cranston and Walter Mondale when they made a U.S. Senate trip to San Francisco. So I've talked to my kids about that, the importance about being involved in politics. And over the last few years, we've heard it over and over again, the importance of the vote. Uh, so at minimum, my children and my grandchildren, my oldest grandchild, obviously, um, knows about the importance of the vote. Curiously enough, the first day of school, she's in third grade, she announced that she wants to be president of the United States. So <laughs> I think that tells you that the activism that um, I was involved with, and actually my dad took me to a union meeting um, when I was probably in, in fifth grade. So that exposure has gone all the way down to my granddaughter and let's see how far this can go. Yeah, I think that uh, social activism and being a citizen participant is always going to be important. It just seems to spike it as we go through you know, turmoil uh, you know, as a nation. Uh, but part of the storytelling um, that I'll use uh, with Jessica is not only telling her what I've experienced, but also letting her know more about her grandmother who's no longer with us. Um, her grandmother, Carol, was very active. And one of the ways I met her at work, uh, she was a union steward um, back in Ohio and was always standing up for uh, women or, or people of color or, or, or people impoverished that didn't always have a voice. So um, definitely will make that um, part of my impact on, on, the, on my granddaughter. I have something to follow up with on Aaron. Um, when we talk about um, activism and protesting and the Black Lives Matter movement and those types of things, my family has a very um, direct, impactful story. My daughter-in-law, her brother, my daughter-in-law is a black woman, her brother is a black man was murdered by a group of white men one day after his 21st birthday who tied him up and drowned him in a lake. And they videoed the, the incident that happened in Georgia. And the white men were not prosecuted because it was an accident. They were just having fun. They were just playing around. So Savion, my grandson, is growing up knowing that this is his uncle, this is his story. My daughter-in-law is very, very committed to activism, especially when everything happened this July. Um, it was hard for me as a grandmother when they took Savion out to the protests and you know, he had a sign, I march for the uncle I've never met. And I had to, as a grandmother, because I had this fear, I had this fear that all this social unrest is happening and my children are doing what I taught them to do. My son is standing for what's right. That's what I taught him to do. But he's out there now when people are you know, dying <laughs> with the baby. But I've, I've come to realize that it's so important for Savion to know that legacy and to know that how to stand for what's right and to stand for his family. And it's important for my granddaughters to know that this is going on with their cousin and to stand for what's right. So as I've always been a proponent of social justice, it has been very important to me. I remember when I first started teaching in higher ed, it was the 1989-90 school year. I was at a local community college when Louise Germans Bark's first book, anti-bias curriculum came out and 
So it's always been something that I have done with my children, been a focus with my grandchildren. But when you have that direct life experience, it really impacts the way that you relate to your grandchildren. These are some yes. really, really powerful perspectives. I'm sorry, was someone preparing to say something and I interrupted? Well, thank you again for these really, really powerful perspectives. I think that brings us to our next question of, and Dr. Krause, you touched on this a little bit just right now, but have any of you maybe experienced challenges rather with your children when it comes to talking to them about social injustice and race? And if so, how have you tackled that with your grandchildren? Is there anyone who'd like to take on the question? Well, my mom has handed down um, some wonderful stories. Um, she grew up in um, a little coal mining town in, in Colorado. And uh, she told her children about the time that she organized a boycott of the theater because the Mexicans could only stay up at the top in the balcony. Uh, so it's, it's stories like that that I'm going, oh my God. But then telling that to my grandchildren, they're going, Good for good for great grandma, you know. Now I know where I come from. These are these are the stories where the the um, grandparents, great grandparents, have overcome financial, economic, living condition prejudices, and we're now in a changed society. There's still more fighting that needs to be done, but. I can tell my grandchildren stories that happened to me and how I was able to make sure I kept safe and let them know that you may be in a position that you are going to have to rely on your wits to keep safe or even better yet, be aware, keep your antenna up to see what's happening and be able to find an escape if you can from a situation that's getting a little too difficult. This is Yolanda. I, I, uh, this is very um, uh, poignant for me. You know, we can do everything we do. We can pass down stories and all of this, but ultimately our children decide their cultural identity. And um, I had a deep discussion um, with my daughter who, um, you know, she had commented on the immigrants and uh, uh, she was not exhibiting any of that compassion or empathy that um, I had raised her with. And I had to remind her um, that part of our identity is we are members of a tar targeted group. I had to remind her that our family also grew up. We, we were initially in Wyoming and um, they, during the grand repatriation, they were sent back even though they were American citizens. And I had to keep reminding my daughter, bringing her back um, to those stories but as an adult, ultimately, I also had to respect her perspective and where she was coming from. And we actually had to come to a point where um, we had to essentially agree to disagree. And it was a sad day for me, but I can honestly say this, um, my granddaughter, her daughter, is not in um, unison with that thought. So uh, it's, it's um, ultimately, we can give, it's like a seed, you know, 
you plant the seed and you hope that that seed is going to grow up and it's going to do what you think it's, it's going to emulate. Um, but ultimately, they do make their own decisions. And right now in our nation, we are, um, we are very divided. We are very divided, even within families. And so with that being said, I have had to stick to the common ground with us. And within the common ground, then using that, you know, to work with and to bring her around. But ultimately, I have had to learn how to respect her views and who she is as a grown woman. And that's so hard to do, Professor Carlos, you know, because our children, like you said, they're adults. And ultimately, they're the ones who are raising our grandchildren. And we can do the best that we can do as grandparents, but we're not the ones raising them, unless they live with us, like Jacob lived with you. So you were able to have that impact with him. And I think, you know, I'm fortunate that my daughter and my son-in-law and my son and my daughter-in-law are doing a very, very good job when it comes to social justice, when it comes to diversity, when it comes to anti-bias, they're doing a good job. But I have two other daughters who are yet to be married, who don't have children. And I know them as adults, but I don't know what's going to happen when their children come. So I may be in that place that, that Professor Carlos is in now. But you know what? I can give you this hope. <laughs> my daughter, my granddaughter is more in, um, in, in you could say, um, we're kindred spirits in that way. And she will ask questions and I will tell her stories. And that has to do because of the closeness I had with, with all of my grandkids, taking them on vacations, doing things with them, that relationship, you know what I'm saying? So fortunately, I can say that it did skip. <laughs> but <laughs> it did skip. But nevertheless, again, I have to say, I have to remember to be respectful and caring, even if she doesn't agree, and it's okay to. Amber, Amber, I think we might have time for one more question before we go on to resources, and then we'll just have one person on the panel answer it. Sure, so it seems as though we've answered all of the questions. However, <laughs> I, I do have one I would love to ask. After seeing and experiencing so much, have there ever been any personal blind spots of your own that you've had to explore and, um, and tackle as well? Is there anyone on the panel who wants to touch on that question? I'll be the problem child. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, you know, we all have blind spots mm -hmm. and um, it's, it's a continual self-reflection of really looking at, am I really what I think I am? Do I really model it and practice it? And um, so uh, when we talk about cultural identity, so I went full on for my, embraced my Latina Latinx identity. I even have my little blouse on. To, to show that I'm celebrating that. And um, my, I have two siblings, they're both brothers and I'm the middle. So I have an older and a younger and they both married um, Anglo uh, women. So they do not celebrate any, any Latino anything, right? Okay, so you know, that's okay. But then I had my sister-in-law that sat me down and she, she pointed it out to all three of us that we say things. And I was like, this was some time ago. This was probably about 15, 18 years ago. And I was like, no, I don't think so. And then she gave me specifics on it. And that really opened up that blind side that I had, that I had to look at, that I had to reflect on, that I had to change so that I wasn't that way. And then it's a continual thing. It isn't done once, once and then done. 
It's something you're continually working on. And I think it's really important because um, in the 21st century, six out of 10 children will be of color, but, and they'll be looking through the world through that unique lens. But we also have to understand that there's that other piece there where they're shrinking and they're fearful. So we have to be mindful of that too, so that we're equipping our grandchildren and grand, great-grandchildren and all of our families so that we're inclusive of all, not just some. But right now I do believe we do have to focus on um, the, we do have to speak on black lives. It is the time right now and the rest will all fall in place. So yeah, Thank I've had my spots. Thank you so much for opening up and for everybody on the panel for answering the questions. Um, Miguel has some resources that he's going to share with us. So Miguel, I'm gonna go ahead and stop my share so you can start sharing your resources. It's amazing how Shelter in Place enables us to view Oscar-winning short movies we would never see otherwise. During shelter in place, we've learned to zoom to cultural museums and webinars to introduce us to cultural values, concerns, and achievements. Jack up the beanstalk, meet Odon the giant. What do you see up here? Swords. Oh my goodness, you're right. And these swords are all from Southeast Asia. And in Southeast Asia, they call swords Chris. Can you all say Chris? Chris. Yeah, they're called Chris. And look, there are Chris down this whole long wall. And over here, we see a statue of somebody who's carrying a sword. Yeah, a sword or a Chris. And I like to think of him as a giant. And I like to pretend that I'm a giant too. Would you pretend with me? A giant would be really big. Make yourselves really big. And make your hands really big. Yeah, and take your Chris and stick it in your belt and stomp around because the giant in our story stomps. Odon the giant from the Philippines and how he loved to stomp around and stomp around on everything all the time. In fact, Odon, he stomped on everything and he paid no attention at all to what was under his feet. He was so big and he was so strong and he was so busy stomping his feet that sometimes he stomped on the houses of the littler creatures and sometimes he even stomped on the littler creatures 
himself. Do you think that was a nice thing to do? No, it wasn't. Well, let me tell you a story about what some five friends, five little creatures did about Odon the Giant. Now, these five friends got together one day and they were upset because they said, that big Odon the Giant, he is stomping around all the time. What are we going to do about it? And so they put their five little friend heads together and they whispered and they made a plan. And the next day, they all got into coconut shells and they paddled down the river to the house where Odon the Giant lived. Now he lived up a big ladder that he had to climb to get into his house right alongside of a river. And we climbed on up and all those teeny tiny animals, they had to work so hard to get up the ladder to Odon's house. And they waited for Odon to come home. Well, nighttime came, and after a good day of stomping around on things, Odom climbed the big ladder to his house, and he sat down in his rocking chair, and he began to rock, and who was waiting for him in his rocking chair but the? Mosquito. Get your mosquito ready. Sting! Oh, oh, what's biting me? It itches, it itches, oh. And the mosquito kept going, sting! Oh, I need to just go to bed. I'm getting all bitten up. And who was waiting for him in the bed but the? Bed, bed bug. bug. And when he got into bed, get your chompers ready. The bed bug chomp, 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 and bit him, and bit him. Oh, what's biting me? What's biting me? I need to go to my fireplace and get my lamp so I can see what's biting me in my bed. And when he got to the fireplace, who was waiting for him? But the, but the, but the bird, the bird. And when he got to the fireplace, the bird who was buried under the ashes, get your bird ready, flapped his wings and the ashes just swirled up and swirled up and got into the eyes of Odom the giant. Oh, I can't see, I can't see. I have to wash these ashes out of my eyes. And he ran to his sink and who was waiting but the? Yeah. Well, when Odom bent down to wash out his face, the crab leapt up and got him right on the nose. Oh, oh, something has bitten me on my nose. My house, it's haunted. I better get out of here. And he turned to run away. And when he ran out the front door, who was waiting for him but the, get your eel ready, the eel. And he tripped right over the eel and fell with a thud right down his ladder onto the ground. My house, it's haunted, it's haunted. And he ran away as fast as he could. And after that, all of the five little friends, they lived together happily ever after because Odon never came back. Oh, thank you. And I'm clapping for you because you did such a good job helping with this story. From California to Florida, thanks to the Glazer Children's Museum videoing multicultural stories. Who are you, Mira asked. I'm an artist, he said, a muralist. I paint on walls. I'm an artist too, she told him. He handed Mira a paintbrush. Then come on. Mira dipped it in the loudest color she saw. Yowie! The wall lit up like sunshine. As the man drew pictures on the bricks, Mira added color punch and pizzazz. Soon Mr. Sachs joined in, then came others. Everyone painted to the rhythm. Salsa, marong, bebop. Even Mira's mama painted and danced the cha-cha-cha. The whole neighborhood became a giant block party. Discovering the similarities and differences of dance and music across countries and across regions within countries.
during COVID, you can stroll your neighborhood campus and look for spots to have a picnic with your grandchild or a museum to visit. Social distancing required. Going up Palm Drive to Main Quad is and will forever be like my personal favorite view of campus. The first thing I remember is having dozens and dozens of people that I didn't know shouting and cheering and saying, come to Stanford. And I remember thinking, wow, how wonderful and inclusive must this community be for someone who actually goes to school here? This is the area that connects the Oval with uh, Main Quad. You'll see as well, we have some beautiful Rodan sculptures here. We have more of those over by the Cantor Art Center. So we're now entering Main Quad, which is the heart of Stanford's campus. It's also the home of our humanities and sciences department. Historically, there were four main departments in the quad, which is why it has four corners. Meyer Green is the perfect representation of how beautiful Stanford's open spaces are. So during spring quarter, when it's sunny outside, which is for, let's say, 80% of the year, these people hang out on Meyer Green, they're reading a book, they're just lying down, they're talking with their friends, working and also enjoying the beauty that is Stanford's campus. The open space is really another thing that's distinctive about Stanford, and I think it just kind of puts me at ease. So this is the row, uh, which stretches on for a very long while. Uh, we have lots of different types of housing on campus. So a lot of people, when they hear about the row at other universities, they might think of Greek life. And here at Stanford, it's very different. There is Greek life. Greek life, about 20 to 25 percent of students are involved in Greek life. But there's also a ton of other opportunities to find cool living communities. I think one of the biggest concerns I had coming to Stanford was, will I fit in? Am I worth it? Um, within the first week, that was a swatch just because the people in my dorm were so excited about me and the things in my life that really made me feel at home. Thank you, everyone. We have come very close to the end of our time. Miguel has put together a list of resources that he shared, and also Professor Carlos has a lot of great resources on 
books and other types of things that will help you with your grandchildren in um, embracing the, the four goals of anti-biased education. So when the recording of this presentation gets posted on the PO website, we will post it along with the handout that has the resources on it. And we will let you know when that is available. It should be the next week or so. We appreciate everybody who was on the panel and we appreciate all of our participants. And we thank you all for joining us today. Thank you.